Welcome to the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. This is the Homegrown at Home 2022 concert series, and I will be interviewing Herb Ota Jr., who is a master of the ukulele, the Hawaiian instrument, and we look forward to talking with Herb. So I should just explain that um, these concerts have been a fixture of the American Folklife Center's programming for many years. During the global pandemic, we moved them to a virtual format where we have artists record uh, videos of themselves in concert, and that's what we've done with Herb. And we then do our interviews also in this online format. So Herb is in Hawaii, and I am here in Washington, D.C. So Herb Ota Jr., welcome. It's really wonderful to have you here. Well, thank you. It's um, it's it's such an honor for me to be a part of this, and um, looking forward to some questions, I guess, from All you. Right. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Well, how about talking for our first question as uh, about the special place of the ukulele, the instrument in Hawaiian culture? Well, I mean, you know, the ukulele originally came from Portugal, and um, it was brought over here and it was like they had certain different names like uh, Braguinha or um, I forgot the other name. But um, some of the uh, the original uh, maker, Manuel Nunes, uh, started making these instruments and um, are one of our uh, monarchs here in Hawaii um, at that time, King David Kalakaua. He actually named it the ukulele because... He was someone. He was watching someone play it, and these guy's finger was all over the place, all over the fingerboard, and he called it the ukulele. And uku means ukulele means jumping flea. So um, that's how the ukulele started, and, um, and now it has become an instrument of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So, and um, it's you know it's been an instrument, as you say, of Hawaii for you know maybe a hundred years or so. But uh -huh. um, but one of the modern masters of the instrument was your own father, Ota San, um, yes. Herb, Herb Ota. So speak about his influence and and how he came into the ukulele world. Well, um, when my father was nine years old, uh, my grandmother, his mom, um, taught him his first song on the ukulele, and. He got so hooked on it that he went roaming around Honolulu, Hawaii, looking for a teacher, someone that knew how to play this thing, you know, like he wanted to learn more and more. So everyone uh, told him to go look for um, Eddie Kamai. Um, he's no longer with us pres uh, physically, but um, my father credits him as his teacher of the instrument. And uh, my father has been playing ever since. And his goal in life was to make the ukulele be known like a violin or viola or like a guitar, you know, another string instrument that's more known across the world. Because my grandmother told him that he'll never make it as a musician, especially <laughs> an ukulele player. So I guess that kind of gave him some incentive, uh, you know, and some drive to... Uh, prove my grandmother wrong and um, and of course his own individual goals but um, yeah he's been very very influential um, in the ukulele scene for geez over 60 years now excellent and why don't you tell us a little about what it was like to grow up with him and have him be your dad as well as your teacher <laughs> um you know, my, my father is a Marine, a, uh, uh, an ex-Marine. So every time I got punished, I had to clean everything with a toothbrush. Um, but, uh, but um, you know, getting, I, you know, my father started teaching me when I was three years old. And, um, well, that's, that's what I, re that's what he remembers and I don't remember anything at three years old. All I remember was probably just eating and watching television. But, um, you know, he taught me the basics. He taught me the chords, how to hold chords. He told me how to read music. Um, 
but you know having a father very popular or famous i should say in the music scene um and for me to uh, take it and decided to be a professional musician with it um it opened a lot of doors i have to be honest but he told me that you know having you know the same name as him could probably open a lot of doors but it's really up to me and how long i stay in the room <laughs> so um you know not only was he a great father but um i consider him to be my idol in terms of the ukulele that's great and uh, do you have any favorite memories of his teaching or his playing? Ha, huh. okay. Um, there's this one story that always sticks out, and I always tell my students this story, is that for my very first solo project back in 97, I asked him to be a part of it because I thought it would have been cool that he do a duet with me on my first project. And I asked him, I said, can we do this song that, that was a hit for you on your first solo project here in the States, in the United States. And he says, Sushi. And there's a song called Sushi. It's really a Japanese song, but they, the producers of, the, uh, of that album that my dad recorded changed it to the word Sushi. So I guess right. he thought that it would be uh, more recognizable. But um, so he asked me if I knew how to play the song. And I said, no, but do you have the sheet music? And he says, do you have a recording of it? And I said, yeah, I do have a recording of it. And I said, yeah, but do you have the sheet music? He goes, well, if you have a recording of it, listen to it. So I locked myself in the room for like three hours, learned the whole song. And I, and I figured, wow, this is cool. I learned a song. I'm going to go tell him. So I opened the door and I looked down and there's the sheet music. Right. So I asked him, I said, I asked you if you had the sheet music. So I thought you didn't have it because you asked me if I had the recording. He goes, well, I, well yeah, I didn't tell you that I didn't have it. <laughs> but I want but I wanted you to learn it by ear. And I said, why? And he goes, so you can test your ear. And then you can look at the sheet music to see if you got it right or wrong. So I looked and I'm going, well, I guess this was a lesson. So, you know, that, 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 that story sticks out to me. That's great. Yeah, I mean, it also sort of opens the question of the oral tradition versus written sheet music. You know, even right. if you were playing it maybe a little differently from the sheet music, you might have still been hearing it, right? So it's, right. it's right, interesting. Right. Because yeah. he always said anyone can learn technically. Yeah. Right. And you can you, you can be to the T reading music and like a viola or violinist and whatnot. But it, until you learn how to um, listen and play with your ear, then that's when the feeling comes in. Right. Excellent. So um, but I but yeah, but that day it didn't strike me like that. It was like, wow. I could have yeah. been done with this like in an hour, but not three hours. <laughs> so, oh, well. yeah. But yeah, but that's, uh, it's great. You know, it, it's a great sense of his sort of teachings and his uh, approach to things. So thanks for the story. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, so we, yeah, we, we wanted to talk a little about maybe other influences that you had too, other people who were uh, influential on your playing. Well, there's so many, there's so many um, people. I mean, I'm known for basically playing Hawaiian music because I love Hawaiian music, the traditional Hawaiian music. Um, I think the beauty of the instrument really um, comes through with Hawaiian music. Um, but I play contemporary as well. Um, I can do jazz if I, if, if I choose to or different Latin beats or whatnot. But yeah. there's so many... Well, my father is number one, because um, like I said before, he's my idol. Um, I love listening to Prince. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think he's just way ahead of his time. To incorporate jazz progressions into pop music, 
you know, it's like when Quincy Jones produced Michael Jackson's Off the Wall album and Thriller, and you hear all these jazz, jazz progressions in the background going, how the, wow, that's pretty cool, you know? Yep. Um, local, local um, Hawaiian, Hawaiian, um, I think you might have heard of a slacky artist. His name is Ledward Kaapana. Yeah, I think Ledward's been in our series, yeah. Yeah, um, he's a big influence on me. Um, it's just his carefree playing. Yeah, it's just a, am it's amazing um, to me. Um, but you know, but it, I mean, I can go down the line. Eric Clapton, right. <laughs> uh, Stevie Wonder. I mean, yeah, just a whole bunch of people. But my father and Levert Kapan is probably and Eddie Kamai. My dad's mm -hmm. teacher was probably my major influences. Great. Now, one of the things that people notice about your playing is you your especially clear tone, that sort of you know crystal <laughs> tone that you achieve sometimes. Um, uh -huh. How does that come about? I mean, is that just part of your your training, or did you just uh, is it something that you cultivated? Or well, I think it was part of my training because my dad had me. You know. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know anyone that has graduated from the Berkeley School of Music um, or anyone that has attended. But it was a rumor that I could be wrong, that for guitar players, they have to go in a room and it's pitch dark and they have to play a piece. I think it was, it was either a final or, or some sort of exam. I'm not sure, but my father used to have me practice uh, playing the ukulele laying on the ground. Um, and he told me that if I can't have the ukulele be an extension of me, then I won't be able to express musically how I really feel through the instrument. So I have to really know my instrument. So he had me laying down and I had to visualize the fingerboard and where my fingers had to go. So I had to keep practicing like that. So, and and he told me later that if you get used to that, and once you look at your fingers and the fingerboard, the, the note will be that much more cleaner. Mm -hmm. So I think it was because mainly for my, the training that I had from my dad. That's excellent. So you were lying on your back and you couldn't yeah. see the, the, the or I mean, I could it, I could if I had my neck, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, up, but I I can't do that for an hour, right? You know, <laughs> so, and then he just he still just walk into the room and he said, "Don't go, don't fall asleep." Yeah, and you know, and and I would just practice scales and songs, and so now it's like sometimes when I'm performing, I I can look throughout the audience while I'm playing, and I probably won't. Well, ninety percent of the time, probably I would I, I would hit my notes where I want to hit them, mm -hmm. or else I'll just, you know, play a wrong note and just smile and cover it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I was going I was gonna ask if you had any advice to other players on technique, but that sounds like great advice right there. That practicing method. Well, you don't. Okay. Well, now when I give that advice, I I don't tell them to lay on the floor. You know, I, you know, I would tell them to go in a, in a, in a room where it's dark and you can't really see your fingers real well and just practice, you know, because uh, once you can have that instrument as an extension of you, um, there's no greater feeling of expressing yourself musically at the truest form. It's just mm -hmm. a great feeling. Yeah. Thanks. So, so one of the things I noticed in the concert um, was you just mentioned that you do that you are, are influenced a little by different Latin beats, and I noticed that your piece Sandcastles has kind of a Latin swing to it, maybe Brazilian sound. Was that something uh -huh. you were going for in that piece? <laughs> well, I mean, I wanted it. I knew that. Um, well, the story goes that you know I was missing home. And, um, but I wanted a more soft, soft jazz kind of vibe. Um, 
but because it's just ukulele, I mean, it, it, you, you kind of have, you kind of feel that Latin kind of beat. But I think if I had like a whole rhythm section with percussions and drums, and I think it would be more of a soft jazz kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I don't, when I write music, I don't feel like, oh, I need to do it this kind of style or it just i just let it flow and it, whatever ends up ends up being you know um so another thing you mentioned um led word kapana and uh, it brings up the question of uh, the influence of slack key guitar also on ukulele players in general but on on you on your playing have you i know you've played with with a lot of different guitarists but how does that influence your playing on your instrument oh um Hawaiian slacky guitar, how should I say this? The feel of Hawaiian slacky guitar, the sound of Hawaiian slacky guitar, of open tuning and playing the bass lines with melody, um, it really, when you listen to it, you feel Hawaii or you think of Hawaii. So when I'm playing with a slacky guitar player, like for example, Ledward or, or someone else, um, I love that feeling, you know? And so it's easy for me to just gravitate to what they're playing and how they feel. And I don't, you know, it makes me wanna just enhance what they're doing instead of overpowering them with, um, theatrics <laughs> i don't know but you know what i mean yeah it's just it's just yeah. a special feel yeah excellent so uh, so you had mentioned actually earlier um david kalakaua the you know as as the person who named the ukulele but someone that was in your concert that you played two songs by was queen lily ukulele um explain her connection and and um you know why you chose to include a couple of her songs? Well, Queen Lily Okalani, um, she was a a wonderful composer of music. Um, there's even a book published of all her songs here. And, um, um, you know, for Hawaiian music, and, and I'm pretty sure for Western music as well, you know, people compose songs to write about their time, their, you know, that day, what's going on during their time when they've written the song. And for Hawaiian music especially, composers back then, um, like Queen Lily Okalani, they wrote about their time. Mm -hmm. And because I wasn't there physically, you know, at least, you know, if I, if I get, if there's Hawaiian lyrics and I, and I have it translated to English, I have a feeling of what it was like at that particular time. And then I'll have a better understanding of the song and how I should express it myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, her, her presence as a songwriter or her, her work as a songwriter is only a, obviously a small part of her legacy. And I wonder if you could fill us in a little on, on what is actually taught about the Hawaiian history and the Hawaiian monarchy in schools in Hawaii. I and mean, what did you learn growing up? Well, I mean, they, I mean, they really, really wanted the people of Hawaii to be protected. Um, and I mean, like, um, like that's, you know, that song, um, you know, during during the overthrow, and she had to be in house arrest yeah. at her palace. Um, um, she wrote this song dedicated to a boy that delivered flowers to her, right? Um, yeah. And she and he picked the flowers from her garden, and not so. Not only every day, she only got flowers. She got flowers and the daily newspaper wrapped around the flowers so she could know what was going on outside of her palace. Because if it wasn't for this boy doing it, 
she would have no clue what was going on outside of her palace. So, right. um, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, the stories behind the songs really teaches me what goes on there. And the monarchy, um, the, the family, the basic family really had talent about with writing music and expressing themselves through music and um that's what i gravitated mostly to was their music writing their composing um i just thought it was beautiful music yeah and it's and it, it will be forever they're timeless yeah absolutely yeah yeah um and how do you think that that sort of colonial history of of Hawaii affects the culture and the music today? Oh, um, for Hawaiian music, for traditional Hawaiian music, people of today write music about their time here. So that's I think that's what they've learned mm -hmm. that they should they should write songs about today. So the people of the future generations will know what it was like here you know instead of just reading it in history books yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah yeah so one thing you mentioned before was that you play different styles of music from traditional hawaiian music to you know current pop but also you play sort of classic pop so you have over the rainbow in the uh in the concert yes. as well yes so so how do you choose what mix to present at any given time uh, for me to for me to learn a song or perform a song, the melody needs to grab me first. Um, I mean, for the ukulele, you have either nylon strings or you have fluorocarbon strings. They don't sustain as long as a steel string guitar. Yeah, an acoustic guitar. So I have to, you know, a melody. That gra that would grab me is a, is a is a there the melody should have a lot of movement in it, um, because for me personally, when I hear a song, for example, if I hear a song on the radio, I won't remember who performed it, but I'll remember the melody. Yeah, right, because that's what people remember first is the melody then they try to figure out who sang it or who performed it right so sure. um i think the melody is the melody of a song is very important and um, um that's what i gravitate to and then i will see what the song is about if the song is political or something like that then i basically choose not to play it um because I don't want to be in the middle of some sort of argument. Right. <laughs> but um, uh, that's why songs that I write, people are saying that people tell me, I mean, their response is that my songs that I originally create are very melodic. Mm -hmm. But I think um, that's important. So Great. So um, I guess one question that would come up for a lot of people just looking at your catalog of the stuff that you've recorded, like uh -huh. how, are, how are you able to be so prolific? Because you've recorded so many different albums. Well, Hal, there's, there's, you know, I, I think there's a lot of songs in me that I still need to present or create. Um, music, see, even though I do it as a profession, um, I still consider music as a blessing in, in a person's life here on earth. Um, I think 99.9% .9 of life would be boring without music. Um, I think music is a huge part of bringing someone's emotions out, you know, it's like watching a television drama without music. It's there's, it's not suspenseful if you don't hear something, you know, right. like in the background, right? But um, I I I just think music is is a blessing. So because I feel that way, 
I think it needs to be shared. I think people need to listen to it, whether it's not from you, but from other people. You know, I just think music just needs to be shared, enjoyed. So I, that's why I keep doing what I do. That's great. So out, out of all those recordings, are there any particular favorite albums that you've done over the years? That's a, you know what's funny? I've never, no one has ever asked me that question. <laughs> that is funny. That is very funny. Um, I, I, I can tell you that there's there's some song there's some albums that are that were very significant in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, my very first solo project uh, because it was my first one. Yeah, and then um, my th third project is when I really got into arranging. Um, that's when I think I started to become my own person in terms of arranging so when people hear this like they would say oh yeah that's herb you know um and then um, my very last project i did a few years ago was celebrating my 30th anniversary so so three projects i don't have a real favorite one yeah um but each each project has a story that's all i have to say okay yeah and a lot of them, or a fair number of them, are duet projects where you're playing with one other person. Um, you know, uh -huh. So you have albums with a, a partner. How do those come about? What and, and how do you decide? You know what we do together needs to be an album. Oh, um, I've done duets with uh, one, two, three, four. I, I you know, I don't remember. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I think the feel of the music has to be somewhat similar. I can't just play with someone and they have a different approach and I have a different approach. Sometimes it more sometimes it works, uh, but mm -hmm. I think most times it doesn't. Well, especially for me. So the people I've done duets with. I have a love for the music that we did and, the, and what we produced. I did a couple duets with my dad, but the reason why I did that is because I wanted to have something for me mm -hmm. that I did something with him. And the last, the, the one album I did with him, we, I, we just recorded all his originals. Um, That's great. Yeah, just, a, just as a tribute to him. So, um, but the, the other people that I've done duets with, they love Hawaiian music. So that's, that was the common bond there. Mm -hmm. And all I had to do was try and fit in my, my feel for, for the music that we were presenting to match theirs. So sure. it would, once you do that, then everything else just falls into place. Mm -hmm. Well, so another aspect of our concert, what, which was really nice, was that you brought Jake in uh, to play as well. So tell oh, us- that up, and, that up and coming uh, ukulele artist? That, yeah, That's right. So tell us a little bit about Jake and how you came to know him and how you came to invite him to be in your concert. Well, um, Jake used to, Jake took a lesson from me when he was a teenager uh see now we're talking about this it makes me feel so old um and um so we've known each other you know when he when he turned professional we've already known each other uh, but you know it was a more like a hi bye how are you doing good take care see you later kind of thing because once he started getting busy and because I was traveling all the time too, we hardly ever saw each other. And then during the pandemic, when we were all locked down in the first part of 2020, um, we, we got to know each other a lot better. Um, and we, and he, I consider him to be one of my best friends now. 
Um, so when I asked him to be a, to do a duet with me for this uh, this this event, then he just said, "Yeah, no problem." So yeah, we've been playing we've been playing together for quite a bit now. I mean, during the pandemic, we've done a lot of projects together, and um, you know, he's one thing I can say about him if people don't know yet is that he's very very genuine mm -hmm. he's a very genuine person and that comes through with his music so um yeah up and coming i know i always yeah. tease him about that but you know <laughs> he yeah. is a, a a great artist for sure um, yes and, and thanks for thinking to have him in the concert because it's just wonderful to see both of you together um, in that video. It was so, a lot of fun. Yeah. So, you know, one thing way back when you were talking about your, your father's influence, you mentioned his first hit in the United States, his first recording that, and that brings up an interesting um, part of the whole Hawaiian music experience, which is the importance of Asia as a, as a market and cultural influence on Hawaiian music because your, your father's music is also very popular um, in Asia and so are a lot of other Hawaiian artists. Right. So talk about Asia as a, as a place where Hawaiian music goes and happens, if you could. Well, um, how should I start this off? Okay, the hula, the dance, the traditional dance of Hawaii, hula, there's over 700 hula groups in Japan. Wow. Over 700 hula groups in Japan, right? In, in Hawaii, we call them halau, like a music troupe, right? Like a dance group. But yeah, there's like over 700, 700 of them in Japan alone. It's growing in Korea. Um, you have hula in Mexico. Uh, so, I mean, with hula comes Hawaiian music, right? Yeah. And my father started, you know, performing in Japan in the 60s. But he wasn't playing Hawaiian music. He was playing more jazz standards, you know, like Stardust. And he was playing pieces like Malaganya and and... But when the when Hawaiian music was introduced to Hawaii, because Jap like Japan, they love Hawaii, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, who wouldn't? Yeah. <laughs> We're just spoiled here. But anyways, um, and then the interest in the hula started to grow. So Hawaiian music, the interest in Hawaiian music started to grow, and now Korea is 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 at a point where Japan was probably 15 years ago and in korea it's only going to grow even bigger and the people in europe are playing hawaiian music yeah um it's amazing uh, i think a lot of hawaii musicians love to go to the orient or asia or anywhere because they have a strong appreciation for the ukulele for Hawaiian music for hula and I think that goes for all musicians you want to go places where they appreciate what you do so um, and during the pandemic it's kind of hard because a lot of Japanese people did or people from the Orient haven't been coming here to Hawaii and we're and we're not able to go there as yeah. of yet so um, everyone's waiting patiently so. Well, it'll, it'll happen again, but that, that actually brings up another question, which is, in general, what the pandemic has meant for Hawaiian musicians and, and for you personally. Well, we had a lot of family bonding, Yeah. which is a, which is a positive thing because I used to travel quite a bit, so I, I'm, I'm glad that I, the positive things that, that that came out of it was I was able to be home and be with my family. Um, my wife hasn't tossed me out yet, so that, which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, but I think for for us musicians here, 
it was difficult because a lot of things were just canceled, you know. Um, so we looked to each other for support, you know, in terms of just talking and being around, you know, online on Zoom or anything, um, anything online, whether it's um, Zoom or StreamYard or anything online it was it was supporting each other the support that we had from each other what is what is getting us through this and um because we all have the same stories oh yeah we had all these tours booked and it's all gone right or yeah. or things like that but i think it gave us a better appreciation of how special and lucky we are living here yeah. And um, I think it all brought us back to earth, you yeah. know, in a good way, in a good way. Yeah. Well, that opens up that another question, which is that connection between Hawaii, the land and Hawaiian music. How, how you know, how is that expressed? How do you feel that connection to place um, in the music? Oh, it's very strong in Hawaiian music. Um, and you know remember when i was saying earlier about you know people wrote about their time right and there's songs about um towns here in hawaii like small towns that people don't even really go to when when people come here you know from out of out of uh state and and like there's a like for example there's a song called ulu palakua it's a it's a hawaiian hula song but it's a small town off the slopes of of the dormant volcano on the island of maui called haleakala mm -hmm. but tourists don't go there but the song describes you know about the coolness of the air you can smell a hint of ginger um you can see all the um the cowboys there riding on their horses and you can see the cattle and then you can see on a clear day you can see the small island of Kaho'olawe. Ka i mean but it, it but that's the connection with um the hawaiian music is that we write about places we write about about um, metaphors like like for example a, a woman could be described as a flower in Hawaiian traditional music you know in the lyrics you know mm -hmm. so the 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 connection of traditional Hawaiian music and the land and the town or flowers or waterfalls or I mean there's a strong connection strong very strong connection great and another thing that that just brought up was the question of the hawaiian language um uh -huh. how is that how's that expressed in the music as well oh like i said i mean it's it's uh, uh there's a lot of uh hidden meanings in hawaiian um lyrics in songs um like i said you know like i mentioned a woman could be explained as a flower a certain kind of flower um, waterfalls like on the big island of hawaii in a place called waipio valley we have twin waterfalls mm -hmm. but that could be a man and a woman yeah right um so hawaiian lyrics um they call it they call it kauna in hawaiian but as hidden meanings but um hawaiian music have a lot of hidden meanings in their lyrics but it's they're very um how do i say it? it's, it's beautiful in how they write um hawaiian lyrics and because they're very they, they, they it's the script the description is so descriptive Mm -hmm. but you wouldn't know i guess you would know if it was if they were talking about a town a man a woman 
or even children or yeah hawaiian lyrics hawaiian lyrics and hawaiian music how it gels together mm-hmm. it's once you get a feel for it it there's there's no other feeling it's 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 that special excellent yeah all right well um it come it's come to the point in the interview where i like to sometimes ask our guests to what they would like to say what if you have a national audience at the library of congress what do you want to tell people about your own music or your tradition hawaii what's the most important thing oh okay um um i hmm let me think about this yeah <laughs> no um you know i i i just i just want to say i just want to say um thank you um for allowing me to be a part of this i, I would like to wish um everyone to be safe and healthy and continue to move forward um but in terms of the ukulele and Hawaiian music or Hawaiian culture, um, there's so many Hawaiians and Hawaii people that live on the mainland or elsewhere in the world. And, um, and we, what we try to do is, is share our definition of the word aloha. Um, yeah. um, to me, aloha means uh, love. Um, to treat other people like how you want to be treated. Um, always more of a, of a giving uh, thing than receiving. Um, but thank you for um, opening your world to Hawaiian culture, to Hawaiian music, to the ukulele, the Hawaiian steel guitar, the Hawaiian slacky guitar, the hula. Um, because um, Hawaii is a special place, and we try to express that through our dance and music. And uh, thank you for allowing us to share that with all of you. Well, we want to thank you, Herb Ota Jr., for uh, this interview and for the wonderful concert video and for being part of that wonderful Hawaiian culture, which we have tried to showcase in other ways over the years as well. So thank you so much for coming to this interview and uh, for just being so great, such a such a nice person too, and such a wonderful musician. Thank you. Well, I, I I appreciate your kind words, and and uh, I appreciate everyone involved, um, and thank you so much for having me. Thanks. <laughs>